And I have a special treat for you. So it's not just elected officials. It's not just librarians and heads of nonprofits and organizations. There are also people here who do organizing and social justice work in using a different method. And with me this afternoon to talk more about their activism in, uh, in entertainment, yet also in the streets is Jasiri X, friend of Swib Nation, whose voice we always hear on uh, our shows. And also with me, very happy to have Immortal Technique. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us on this stage to talk more about not only why you're here at Netroots, but I wanna have a little bit of conversation about the work that you guys do on an everyday basis, because you're not just entertainers. Um, you're activists, you're doing this work, you live and breathe this work. Um, it's not something that you just collect a check for. So I appreciate you, I appreciate the work, and looking forward to have a conversation about that. But first, let's talk about why you're here. I wanna start with Immortal Technique. Why are you at Netroots? Well, thank you very much for having me on the program. Um, I came here because I was actually invited. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I found that I, there were very much like-minded people. Um, of course, Puente, who I had done an event with on Van Buren in the hood in like a, a parking lot where we were trying to stop mass deportations back then. And we explained the difference uh, between how the right wing and the left wing would interact with us. And I think that there was obviously um, a, a disconnect at some point when people began to turn their attention to the Obama administration and say, hey, listen, when we were organizing and he got elected, we weren't the ones that were supposed to fall back. We were the ones that were supposed to remind him that we got him elected. There were people that reminded him that he got elected. Right. Wall Street and Israel reminded Obama, hey, we got you elected. Right. The black and Latino community, I don't think, did a sufficient job of, of saying to him, listen, without our support, your grassroots campaign would be nowhere. And I right. think that to make it larger than just an elected official, we have an election coming up for president again. After that, we're still going to have to be organizing. So I'm here to build inroads, to build um, solidarity movements with as many people as possible. You know, I, I enjoy being able to connect with activists that, A, I've never heard of. Uh, but I know that they're killing it wherever they are. And as soon as I, I get an inkling of what they do, you know, I'm inspired by that. I'm inspired by their work. And it's not just from one walk of life. These are people that come from every walk of life, you know, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, atheist, you know what I mean? White, black, Latino, indigenous, Asian, whatever it may be. I, I think that at some point, you know, we acknowledge that we may have small petty differences that are political, but we're all geared towards going the same direction. And we we both know what's wrong with we all know what's wrong with this country and i think that you know being able to confront that as a united voice and especially being from a hip hop culture where we were created to address controversy as opposed to now where people accuse hip hop of going commercial it's not a question of hip hop going commercial hip hop became a commercial it became mm. a commercial for cars and for other commodities that people wanted so now whenever you hear that music you automatically associate it with the product before the the movement was built around not selling out. Now the point is to raise your political capital up to the top point that you possibly can so you can sell it to the highest bidder. And I'm, as an independent artist, that has never been my goal. You know what I mean? I've, I've never wanted to, to, to sit there and, and have to wear the corporate crown of rap. That, that's not the, the, the point here. The point is to address those issues and to get them to as many people as possible and to build inroads with individuals that I didn't know about who maybe didn't even know about about me, you know what I mean? Because I, I, I may be a popular artist to people from the underground, and there may be other people who have no idea what I do or how long I've done it, and there's never any negativity in that exchange. The beautiful thing about being here is that I've experienced nothing but positivity, <laughs> even from people that I may have small disagreements about the nuances of getting revolutionary or, or activist stuff done. You know, I, I find myself a, around like minds, and I appreciate that, and that's why I'm here at Netroots. Well, you said uh, a lot. <laughs> 
in there, um, particularly um, the point I get in arguments all the time. Uh, you know, by day I'm a political strategist and I do political and campaign work all the time. And when we get in meetings sometimes in politics, people say, well, you know, people of color, you know, we have to give the president a break and he's trying. And I'm like, um, no, number one. And two, he said, make me do it <laughs> on everything. So he's very clear from his background in terms of the support that needs it. And I'm very clear, you can't tell me to shut right. up. Like, you can't tell me that I can't advocate. I don't care if he shares the same skin or the same background. Right. You operating that position of power, that operation, that, that operating that institutional power, I have to press you to act on my behalf. Absolutely. And so telling me, you know, and some of our uh, um, uh, people of color who are elected officials are guilty of that as well, Absolutely. where they say, well, because I'm here, you're not supposed to be too loud or sort of embarrass me into right. acting. And I think that there's obviously a difference in between people that, that choose a, a confrontational style of doing things, whereas they never make the first gesture to say, can we have a conversation at least? Right. I've always been of the mind that before I decide to go nuclear and attack somebody <laughs> and insult them, I at least, I mean, even, you know, I want to point out my sister Carmen from the Justice League is here. They made several offers to have a d dialogue and a discussion before all the die-ins and before all the marches started. Absolutely. The reason that we were pushed to that level, the reason that they found no other thing to do that, which is always the counterbalance to the criticism, oh, why didn't you do this? We tried that. We, we invited you to have a sit-down. We invited you to change the policy that is destructive to the citizens of this city. And you refused to even meet with us. So now you have to meet with us. Absolutely. Now we're going to make it impossible for you not to meet with us. Now we're going to show up at your front door. You right. know what I mean? And we're not showing up to burn your house down. You know, we're not the Philadelphia police in 1985. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> oh, you know, um, let me bring Jasiri into this conversation um, because certainly Jasiri uses uh, uh, his uh, talent and voice to further the mission of uh, advancing social justice in this country. So Jasiri, why, uh, you know, we've been to Netroots a couple of times, at least since, you know, I've known you. And we were just reminiscing about the time, the first time I came to Netroots and I cooked for, I, I cooked for everybody at the house. Yes. That was, we, we don't Good yeah. fried chicken, no stereotypes. Type, but it was very <laughs> we don't get a chance control. to build like yeah, that anymore. But talk to us about why you're here 2015 and why you keep coming back. A um, couple of reasons. Well, one, I mean, I always feel like um, in political spaces that um, hip hop is such a powerful tool, you know, and a lot of times it's just not acknowledged. I, I feel like a lot of times in these spaces we talk, we're gathering data and we're talking about organized, we're doing stuff. And I, and I feel like part of the reason we win because we cooler. <laughs> like you look at the right wing, they lame. They old, lame, corn, you know what I'm saying? Like we got, we, we got swag, like we, we got culture, we got, we got rhythm, we got soul. And uh, I just feel like um, we don't do that enough. Like we don't uh, engage artists enough that speak to these issues. I mean, you hear Mono Technique speak about an issue like, I mean, he's, he's speaking like, you know, a law professor on the issue, but at the same time, he can go and, and hit the stage and perform and, and, and rally people that you might not even know or might not even come to something like Netroots if Immortal Technique wasn't here. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy that they engaged the brother um, and that this year there's a music track at Netroots, which is something different, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and that, like, you know, it, it, although it took 10 years, it's here now, you know what I'm saying? And hopefully, um, you know, they'll engage music more uh, because, I, you know, that's to me, that's one of the ways we win, you know what I'm saying? We win through culture and, I mean, t I would argue that the creation of hip hop is one of the greatest uh, cultural organizing um, events that happen, you know, in history. And I feel like if we really look at it like that, maybe we'll approach hip hop and hip hop artists with a, a higher degree of respect. So let's talk about that a little bit more, because I think both of you use your talent and use hip hop um, and use music to uh, advance the message um, and various messages um, as they may be, and you both choose. Um, to do it in a different way, like you mentioned, sort of not seeking sort of this corporate sanctioned approval right. to, you know, get the big checks, but sort of doing it independently. Why do you choose that method and what is the benefit? I mean, we know, we can learn about the cons no, no, about no, no, no. that, but what are the benefits of doing that? Well, I mean, I, I think you get to the heart of the problem and you're able to attack uh, people's narratives that are obviously very skewed. You know, just for the record, I, I know a lot of 
right wingers that have rhythm, but that doesn't change the fact that they have a rudimentary understanding of history. You have to tell these people, listen, what you believe about this is fundamentally flawed. Even let's talk about immigration, for example, when they don't realize that there were laws on the books that specifically asked for just Nordic people to come to this country. That was before they were accepting of Southern Europeans and of Eastern European that were Eastern Europeans that were largely uh, uh, Jewish coming to this country because there was massive anti-Semitism at that time. I think that when we look at that particular perspective, then we can juxtapose it with just about every other time that someone says something totally out of line and ignorant, like, okay, you guys don't protest when someone kills someone in your own community. Okay, thank you for trying to devalue and dehumanize black life more. The difference is that if so-called said quote-unquote gangbanger or whoever it is kills someone in the street, if they're caught on camera or they're even pointed by a witness that's shady or, or even a paid witness, because now that's what they have, paid informants. Absolutely. They come out and say that guy killed someone, he's going to jail for life. But if you catch an officer of the law on camera shooting someone in the, on the floor while they're handcuffed in Oakland or shooting a Mexican brother with his hands up in Washington or, or, or shooting a brother is- over a traffic ticket, then that officer typically never even goes to trial. That's the difference because we're looking for justice in that situation. And it just doesn't apply to the, to the, 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 the modern mythology, but even the past ones. Like I really had to go in on someone the other day when they talked to me about, oh, you know, black people sold themselves into slavery. I said, okay, let's study Western African civilizations. No, this is sister. This is what I have to deal with on a regular basis. And this, when you attack, you know I'm what? sure you do too, but the premise <laughs> of the question is very, very clear when you tell people, let's examine the kingdoms of West Africa, which kings complied with the Portuguese and the Dutch slave trade and which didn't. The ones that didn't were effectively executed, removed from power and replaced by somebody that did. That story is interchangeable with an indigenous uh, story of how people got, uh, uh, for example, Manhattan. They say they bought it for $23. Uh, that's absolutely untrue. That's a fallacy. That's a mythology. They, they, the tribe that was at, living in, in uh, New Jersey at the time had a war with them. And the, the settlers, which is a nice word for land stealers and thieves, came in and said, you know what? We'll give you money for your enemy's territory. Now, not even imagining in their mind that one day these people would then return and say to someone who had beef with them or an issue with them right. to make it understandable for people out there, oh, well, boom, well, give us your land. Well, so you know, I, we use history to attack that. And I guess from hip hop, as a hip hop perspective, I try to inject as much of that into the music. Sorry. Well, people like to pick and choose the history they uh, want to use, right? So if you have a conversation <laughs> with someone and says, so, you know, they go back to the founding fathers, but then when you try to go, okay, but before the founding fathers were here, there were people here that, oh, why do we have to go? We're in this country now. And I'm like, but no, wait, how are you deciding? Uh, uh, those are, those <laughs> like, are sa- we call those salad bar progressives. You know what I mean? They pick and choose what they want from the salad bar justice. They pick and choose what, what issues they want to, um, want to start and, and they change the goalposts all the time on, on, on these conversations. Um, and certainly using, um, you know, I agree with you, Jasiri, in terms of the use of hip hop um, and uh, Immortal Technique. You mentioned this in the beginning as well and talking about the beginnings. You know, I'm 36 years old like hip hop was was all and is all I knew in terms of the birth of a uh, genre not of a music but there's a difference between the music and the culture we still waiting for that that mixtape you made uh, See, what back ha- in the day so, um, <laughs> uh, you know I have you we know still for them lock safely them bars. In, let me get lock safely in a in a vault you know I, I'm out. trying to have a political career um, so nobody wants to hear the 16 bars from Shorty Love from back in 19 not no no, no, nobody wants to hear that right now. <laughs> um, but, you know, so, so there's this difference of the, the, the music and the culture and then how both of them interweave together. Um, and it was and is, I try to teach my uh, younger brother and interns about, like, how hip-hop politicized us, made us um, more knowledgeable of South African apartheid, made us knowledgeable about gun violence, made all of the, the our music and our culture sort of influenced that. And, you know, there's always a debate of different generations, but how 
how how do we turn that on or sort of try to interject that into current and future generations? I think it's happening. I mean, you know, you listen to Immortal Technique, I mean, you're going to get an education. So, I mean, straight up, off top, you know what I'm saying? And it's, and he's going to point you to different books and places where you can kind of do the research on your own. I think that's still happening. I, I feel like, um, you know, when you look at, like, quote, unquote, mainstream, I think that one of the differences between, like, back then, um, to, to, like, the corporations had totally taken over mainstream hip-hop. So you had a whole bunch of different labels. You had a whole bunch of different means. You, at that time, still had, like, community radio stations where now right. it's, like, Clear Channel has come in and, you right. know, they're uh, programming your city's radio station from somewhere else. And so right. local artists don't even have access. Um, but there still are artists out here right now. It's just about, you know, finding those artists and kind of in inter interacting with those artists. I always tell people it's kind of like uh, when I go to a different, like, when I go to a different city, um, I know McDonald's is going to be there. And I know it's going to be terrible. <laughs> like, if I want to know, like, where the good restaurant is, I either have to ask somebody or I have to, like, go online and do the research. I feel like it's the same that way with hip-hop. It's still very good hip-hop artists. It's still people putting those messages in it. It's just that sometimes you have to find where they are. Ask somebody, like, yo, man, who are the artists that are really coming, you know, uh, uh, with, with, that, with that real, you know, uh, hip-hop and real education and real cultural understanding? And it'll be like, boom, this one, this one, this one, and that one. Well, to, to put you guys on the spot for that, right? So besides yourselves, because obviously you listen to yourselves, besides yourselves, who are you listening to? Who are you enjoying? Who are you bumping? Um, oh, oh, well, my, my, my favorite um, hip-hop artist right now is named Cy Rock. You know what I'm saying? It's a sister from Atlanta. Um, if you don't know Cy Rock, she's incredible. Uh, Kadir Latif, you know, um, out of Buffalo, New York, is, you know, one of my favorite hip-hop artists um, as well. Uh, Rebel Diaz, I'm going to do a show with them uh, tomorrow in the Bay Area. Um, as well as uh, Aisha Fukushimi, who's a, 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 a black and Japanese sister who's incredible, goes all over the world, sings and raps. And so it's a lot, too. You know, somebody like, you know, uh, Rhapsody. Of course, I listen to Immortal Technique. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, I love Kendrick's new album, To Pimp a Butterfly. I love J. Cole's uh, album, you know, uh, 2014 Forest Hill Drive. I love Joey Badass's new album. I feel like we're actually getting to a point where we're beginning to kind of... Uh, uh, you know, artists are able to really express themselves more, and I feel like artists are embracing more, you know, because I feel like the movement is pushing artists, you know what I'm saying, to speak to more of these uh, relevant issues in our community. Um, well, two of the artists, I guess, I, I just named two modern artists, and I just want to say something about the correlation of that. Um, two artists that I know is one of them is Constant Flow, who will be here with me tomorrow. Um, who, who, I, I love his album. Um, because he presents it from a Latino perspective, but also from one that grows up in an urban society in New York where Unfortunately, I, I come from the, I'm coming from the West Coast, and I see a lot more division between black and brown out there than I would see on the East Coast. And I think that I, I like also uh, artist Hassan Salam, who recently had an album called Life in Black and White. And he's speaking on how a, an identity crisis almost formed in him as a child that he had to overcome because part of one half of his family wouldn't accept mm. his black side. And I, I think that, that you don't realize that that's incredibly damaging as a child. The other thing I want to say is that in our culture in hip hop, I'm, I'm unfortunately have to point this out because it, it creates uh, uh, the legitimacy of a stereotype that is very, very commonly associated with America. And it's unfortunately one that's become proven true all the time. And this is not me bad mouthing this country. But if you look at this nation and you realize what we're doing, just to make a point that fits directly to hip hop, the way hip hop doesn't really always appreciate it, its elders. You can look at this nation and realize that they don't give a sh about the elders and the old people in this country. They always treat them so horribly. And, and I'm not saying that one culture is superior to another, but in, in Latino culture and indigenous culture, we don't shove grandma in a home and leave her there and, and, and abandon her. No, grandma lives with us, man. You know, one, I said this and I was very angry about it before. Once a man, twice a baby. You know what I mean? You came into this world crawling and shitting in your pants and you're going to leave this world that way if you ever grow enough to be old that way. I, I mean, it astounds me 
the, the, the horrific way that we treat the people who are supposed to be able to train us mm -hmm. from the mistakes that they made. And, and by that, I mean to say that I don't just listen to the, to the new artists that come out. I love to listen to the classic artists, the ones that were able to share their tutelage with me. People like KRS-One, uh, uh, Cool G Rap, um, Tribe Called Quest. You know, I, I, the list goes on and on. Rock him. People that, that really were the, the, the pillars of the culture. So I, I just know that from New York, I always had the privilege, the benefit to be able to have the ear of these people. I always had the ability, since I lived in a gigantic city-state epicenter, to run into one of them at a show and say, hey, let me pick your brain about this. So my perspective is now, as an artist that's come of age in his mid-30s, to say, okay, if a young artist comes to me and asks my opinion about the game or about the business or something, it's now my responsibility to pass down what I've shared. And the same thing applies to anybody that's learned anything. If anybody here has ever gone to college, my question is simple to you. Can you take what you learned at that four-year school or at that eight-year experience or that doctoral experience, and can you teach that to someone who has no formal education? Can you translate that information back down to the people that are living and so-called layman's? Because if you can't, then you wasted your money at college and you wasted your time. Because we're supposed to be able to take that information. What you learn at college is to learn how to teach other people those skills. And I think it's, it's offensive that we don't do that in hip hop because other genres of music love their elders. You never heard some new rock and roll act come out come talking about, oh, the Rolling Stones, them niggas is washed up. We ain't fucking with them. Eh. Oh, you know what I mean? The Beatles, they all dead. They don't matter no more. No, man, you show the people that came right. before you respect. I mean, there's more of that you'll find in the R&B world, where at least the R&B right. singers will say, no, Donny Hathaway, yeah, Marvin Gaye, wow, incredible artist. Whereas in hip hop, I think there's, there's no there's a generational gap. And I say the father is important in the family, of course, because he raises the son, but the grandfather is just as important because he teaches the father how to be a father. Yeah. That's all. You know what? I, you know, that's really, uh, and as you're saying that, I, I'm thinking about, I'm having this conversation about the creation of holidays uh, to be able to take some time, not just to have a day off to sleep, but really more holidays for people of color to do the transition transfer of memory and the transfer of our history um, and uh, taking time, whether it be is it, if Kwanzaa for those who choose to do it then or other times to actually do this transfer, teach your family history, your family tree, your what we used to do. And so as you're sitting here and you're, you're, you're talking about that, I was like, wow, wouldn't it be great for a hip hop holiday on appreciating um, uh, uh, and introducing future uh, uh, new uh, younger generations to someone? Because I remember remember introducing Rakim, who's one of my favorites, to my younger cousin and watching his mind be blown. Like, you know, I'm playing some of my favorite tracks for him and he, he's like rapping, like he's wanting to be a rapper now and I'm yelling at him about, I was like, you ain't no real rapper, you got a ghostwriter, so I'm, you know, we doing this back, <laughs> like back and forth. I was like, you know, he's like, no, I perform well. I was like, whatever. And <laughs> like, I'm ha playing music for him on like, this is, you know, real. and we spent the afternoon, one building, you know, as cousin and family, different generation, we're, you know, 30 years apart, uh, well, 20 years apart, I'm sorry, and then playing Rakim for him and him being like, what? Like, he's like, what? He was saying this, what? Like, he, like it was a whole, like a whole thing, and he, now he's immersed in it, right? And so, um, definitely sort of that uh, contribution to our future generations, our younger generation, and being able to honor those who created that. I mean, when people, especially young artists, they come to ask me about developing their craft, I ask them, what do you want to learn, right? If you want to advance your flow, well, then study different people's flows. You study the, the artists of the past. Study who invented the double time flow. It's a lot more prominent in the Midwest and the South than it would be on the East Coast. But you study those early artists, not the ones that are coming out now, but the ones from the 80s and 90s. If you want to study, for example, and, and have your, your conceptuality in depth, well, then you have to talk to elders, people that have been uh, behind bars for long periods of time people that have been the movement. Hey, talk to people who have abandoned the movement and say, well, this is the reason I left. It's important to get everybody's perspective. If you want to improve your lyricism, well, then guess what? A, a, a rapper 
who wants to improve lyricism needs books the way a knife needs a sharpening stone. You know what I mean? If you don't advance your vocabulary, if you don't advance the concepts that you use, you'll be stuck in the same old regurgitated thought pattern. The other thing is, I don't judge people's content ever. I know some people have a problem with that. They'll say, oh, but he's saying something misogynist or he's saying something ignorant. I say, yes, but he's a child. And I'm not discounting his ability. I'm not saying that we shouldn't hold him responsible. I'm saying there's a difference between the way that you castigate an adult and the way that you educate a child. Why are you angry at him? He doesn't know any better. When I approach students, and I did a prison program with, again, Carmen Perez, big love to the, the Justice League. And when you took children, you asked them real questions and, and very heartfelt ones. Okay, you want to make a song about selling drugs? Fine. Tell me what it's like to sell crack to a pregnant woman, right? Tell me what it's like to sell the drugs that you watched your parents grow up abusing. Because anybody that I know who's a child and knows how to cut up an onion or understands drug language is because they watched someone in their family grow up abusing or selling drugs. Tell me what it's like to have people glorify your lifestyle when it's not glorious at all. Tell me what it's like to, to have people rat on you for something that you didn't even do and get away with things that you did. Just increase the conceptuality of it. And before you know it, you've really actually become an artist instead of a parrot and a mouthpiece that regurgitates things that you heard and then repeats them without the understanding or the knowledge because power without perception is not only spiritually useless, it's physically useless. You know what? So, um, you know, in one of my other capacities as uh, I head up a social justice organization in Brooklyn, um, I might have to have you come to Brooklyn and teach you. Yes. <laughs> hey, we open for that. We, we my, we my open young for that. people no, 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 no. sort of expand, uh, expand. At Immortal it. Tech on Twitter, get yeah, at me, man. Def I, I'll come definitely. To your hood, man. Well, um, gentlemen, I know um, Immortal Technique has a show tomorrow. Yes. Um, talk to us about that. Um, I'll be at the Monarch Theater. I'm going to post the information on the Twitter and the Facebook, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, and the Instagram, uh, Tech Immortal or Immortal Tech. Um, I have my brother Poison Pen and uh, Constant Flow coming through. I, I definitely want to show people, and especially maybe some of the people that have never heard of me, that there is another side of hip hop. There are people like myself and Jasiri X that will show you a different perspective, one that may have very, very uh, uh, difficult things to hear, but I promise you that the violence is never gratuitous, right? It's never for no reason. We're not talking about shooting and killing people for our amusement. If we have a song that talks about rape, well, then we're talking about how, quote unquote, Latino people came to be because we are the product of a rape, the rape of our nation and the rape of our women by Spaniards and other people from other countries that came here and divided us, raped us so much that we became a different race to people, you know? But we're really a mixture of indigenous people, African people, and Europeans. And I, I don't think that when we talk about this mixture, we have to confront that because I know that there's recently been issues in, in, uh, in, in the news where you find that Latin American nations are in severe denial about their race and about their culture. And I think we can, we can single them out. I mean, but that doesn't do... Uh, 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 that doesn't that doesn't do them any service because if you're going to tell me oh the Dominican Republic has a real problem with racism as if Mexico doesn't as if Cuba doesn't as, as if, if every other country does doesn't <laughs> when if you go to some of these countries and especially speaking from a South American and a Central American perspective we in from Peru to Chile to uh, to, to all the way up to Mexico why is it that we are always down talking the indigenous people why is it that we don't give them credit for the the civilizations that they created, and why is it that we're allowing Univision to present itself as the defender of Latino people when it's always had a racist imagery that is totally anti-Afro-Latino and anti-Indigenous? That is something that we, as a collective group of people, need to confront and say, I'm sorry, you're only showing that much of our people. We are a wide spectrum of individuals. You know what I mean? We're not just all white Catholic people. That's absurd. I mean, not even when you look back on it, and because we're talking about history, Europe itself was never a completely white Christian entity. That is another mythology people need to confront. As long as Islam existed, there's always been Muslims there. As long as Judaism existed, it's always been there. As long as there's been people of color, they've always been in and out of Europe. And to look at it from that perspective is absurd. And I think when you, when you hit people like that, 
It's like waking them up when they're fast asleep. Sometimes you'll get a negative reaction. But think of it the way that you you have, if you ever woken your child up for school at five o'clock in the morning when he don't want to get up. That's exactly what that person is feeling. True. They were happy and comfortable asleep before you came along and told them, this is how it really is. So yeah, you're going to get some grumpy nonsense, but at the end of the day, they're going to be happy that you woke them the fuck up and didn't miss the bus. Well, <laughs> Yes. So if you want to hear more of that, get more of that knowledge. And you, y'all really, y'all really need to have a mortal technique on the keynote stage. Next I know, year, right? At this point. This. For real, for real. I'll be there tomorrow. If you want to hear, if you want to hear more of that with a hot beat behind it, tomorrow at the Marnock Theater. Those of you with a badge from Netroots, hold it up. Your badges from 7:30 to 2 a.m. You can rock out with Immortal Technique, Constant Flow, Poison Pen, and DJ Static at the Monarch Theater here uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Moving on, I know Jasiri that you have another album coming out soon too, and I yes. the, particularly I want you to talk about this because of the interest I have in the title of the album. Um, yeah, it's called Black Liberation Theology, um, and it, it really, you know, I, I found interesting just kind of like black, black is black. You know what I'm saying? Like black is back. It's like we talking about Black Lives Matter. We talking about black people. You know, it was a while where it was kind of like we're African Americans, and you know, he was trying, and it's like, oh, right, right, with Nick, right. Our generation's like, no, we black. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and proud of it. And and so it's really, what does Black Liberation look like? Um, and then also too, for me, the album is really an ode to. Um, uh, the albums in the 90s, what I used to love about like the albums in the 90s was that you would get hip hop, but then you would also get like a clip of a speaker, you know what I'm saying? And like mm -hmm. it would always be these things that would give you more knowledge. So it's really a tribute to those type of albums. So I'm getting, you know, I'm gonna have different clips, different speaking, and, and, and I hope that it kind of contributes to, you know, just raising our, our awareness, you know what I'm saying? So it's really good. I got David Banner on it, Chuck D's on it, um, my brother Ryan Fest is on it. So I'm excited about that uh, happening. Um, so yeah, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I do wanna say this because the more techniques up here because really man he's somebody I feel like because he did it I felt like I could you know what I'm saying because he mm -hmm. did it independently because he did it without you know corporate backing he did it himself you know what I'm saying he paved the way for artists like myself to be like I can do that you know what I'm saying and so I always say that man I feel like I'm walking in his brother's footsteps man so I want to publicly acknowledge that man. I, I'm walking in other people's footsteps because they were definitely artists that came before me that did all the independentness and I had the benefit of talking with them and, and I appreciate that and what what's good about it is that it takes us back 360 to the conversation we have about respecting the elders and even the fact that they were so humble to tell me from their mistakes. So when you go speak to youth, I always tell people, don't just tell them your victories. Tell them about your mistakes. Mm. I always tell people I'm successful not because I succeeded every time, but because I failed more times than other people were willing to try. That's why I'm successful. Because other people gave up and said, well, man, maybe this ain't for me. You know, I'll give you a perfect example. I came out of prison at, at the age of 21 and I said, man, I'm going to try to get a record deal and if I don't get one in a year or two, you know, I, I, I'm going to quit and get a regular job. And here I am, you know, 12 years later and I never got a record deal. I, you know, began my own label. I started pushing my own product and I, I, I wanted to remove a middleman so I could have a conversation directly with the people. I think that, you know, when you look at, you look at organizing, it's sort of the, the similar way. You're confronted with a leftist organization. You're confronted with an institutional corporate left and then you're inter introduced to people that actually do the ground work and the grassroots work that are on the ground in the street and I'm interested in talking with those people you know I'm interested in working with those type of individuals that affect people's lives on a regular basis so I guess the first thing that we have to do in that scenario is lose our ego and realize that we have to you know in the past people used to keep these little secrets and and, and, and these little tricks of the trade to themselves and now I feel like we can't afford to do that anymore I just have to open the door and say, hey, listen, take these teachings, do what you want to do with them. If you misuse them, that's on you. That's not on me. The premise is that I want to pass them to you so that you don't end up making some of the same mistakes that I made in the beginning of my career, you know? Wow, well, Real thank talk. you very much to both thank of you, you to Jasiri X you. and Immortal Technique yeah. for joining us on the Twib Nation live stage. Thank you. Uh, for sharing your information, for sharing your talent and sharing your voice and for the work that you do uh, advancing social justice. I really uh, appreciate it.